Well, hello and welcome to everyone that's here today. I'm Sally Staley, the Chief Investment Officer for the University's endowment and for its retirement funds. And we're the sponsor of today's program and Dr. Glick's visit to campus today. If you're inclined to think that uh, combining investments and water in the same sentence sounds a little strange, I'll tell you emphatically that it's not. We think continuously about geopolitical trends, trends in natural resources, and demographics and economics, and how all of that impacts the investment decisions we make for the endowment and the retirement funds. So water is the ultimate natural resource, and its future is a regular topic of discussion amongst the staff in the Office of Investments. So I think it's entirely reasonable and expected that we are, uh, have the pleasure of hosting today's program. And to introduce our speaker, here's P Provost Bud Vaislack. Thanks, Sally. And Sally will be up giving stock tips after the presentation today, in case any of you are interested. Well, good afternoon. You know, in the summer of 2010, last summer, Case Western Reserve launched the Year of Water, with events, speakers, programs planned throughout the year focusing on issues related to bottling of water, water quality, and water conservation. Today, as part of this series, I would like to welcome to campus Peter Glick, one of the world's foremost experts on water. Today, Dr. Glick will speak on peak water, new thinking about world water problems and solution. solutions. Dr. Glick is a co-founder and president of the Pacific Institute. His research focuses on critical connections between water and human health, the hydrologic impacts of climate change, sustainable water use, privatization, and globalization, and international conflicts over water resources. He regularly provides testimony to the United States Congress and state legislatures and has published many scientific articles and also is very active around the country and the world giving presentations like we're going to hear this afternoon. He serves as a major source of information on water issues for the media and has been featured in a wide range of water-related documentary films. Peter and I had spent some time earlier today, and I think you'll be very interested in what he has to say, um, the experiences he brings, again, from a group that literally works globally, from Indonesia to Colorado, or, or, excuse me, around the U.S., and uh, in many different aspects of, of water conservation and climate. So, again, thank you for being here, and we look forward to your presentation. Well, thank you, Provost Baslack, uh, and to Case Western for inviting me. Uh, I've had the opportunity to spend the day talking with staff and faculty and students about a very wide range of activities on campus related to water and sustainability and all of the issues connected uh, to those. I think if any of you are interested in any of those topics, there's something for you here. You can find some way to get involved in addressing the issues of water or environmental sustainability, uh, and I've, I've learned a lot in my conversations. The title of my talk is Peak Water, New Thinking About Problems and Solutions Around Water. I think we're desperately in need of new thinking. Our current use of water around the world is unsustainable. Uh, we hear headlines and we see evidence about this every day from resurgent cholera in places like Zimbabwe and Haiti to depleted reservoirs and overpumped aquifers in China or in the western United States, from farmers killing farmers in Africa to cities shutting down farms in China. I think that ultimately and inevitably, we're going to move to a sustainable future for water. But there are many paths to that future, and some of them are more attractive than others. And I think part of the challenge that we face is figuring out how to get from where we are today to a more sustainable future for water. We live in a remarkable time, an amazing time. The world of water is changing. The assumptions that we made in the last century about water resources are changing. The characteristics of our, wa of our world are changing. Uh, the things we thought we understood are, are changing. 
for water managers or for students or for, or for academics or for politicians, for economists, for planners, for engineers, there, there's a lot going on. There are new technologies, there are new ideas, there are new policies. And unfortunately, there are some new unresolved challenges. I, I think we're at the start of what I would call the third era in water. And I hope as this era progresses, we will ultimately see safe, sustainable water available for everyone. Uh, the true integration of human and ecological concerns, elimination of conflict over water, uh, the, the development, development of new ways of confronting the water challenges that face us. And in my talk this afternoon, uh, I'm going to describe the three eras, what I call the three eras in water, the new challenges that face us, the concept of peak water, uh, and new tools, new solutions for solving the challenges that face us. And specifically, something I call the soft path for water. I'll also talk about Mesopotamia, uh, 19th century poetry, Sumerian myths, uh, Kashmiri proverbs, the Green Revolution, Dante's Inferno, and baseball philosophy, uh, all of which, as you know, are closely connected with water. For most of the people living on Earth, the first era in water extended from ancient times up until perhaps the mid-18th century. And it consisted primarily in just taking water out of the environment whenever we could find it and dumping our wastes back into the environment as quickly as we could. Our rivers and streams were both the source of water supply and the sinks for our detritus and human and, wa and industrial waste. And when the population of the planet was small and life was relatively short, that worked okay. Uh, people were dying of a lot of other things other than water-related diseases. And the terrible consequences of childbirth and plagues and malnutrition were the dominant worries. And so the first era in water was a simple one. We took water when and where we found it, and we got rid of our wastes. The second era in water began really in isolated pockets of civilization as villages outgrew their local water supply, as agriculture started to become more and more important. Uh, and we saw it in the ancient cities of Rome and Greece. We saw it in the agricultural fields of Mesopotamia and in the Indus Valley in India and other places where growing concentrations of people basically required more centralized management of water resources. In some ways, the second era of water really began in the early to mid 1800s. Uh, cities in Europe and in America were growing. Uh, they were reaching critical size and outgrowing their water supplies. And at the same time, human uh, ingenuity, scientific advances and development were growing very, very rapidly. Engineering ingenuity was blossoming. And the famous poet Coleridge wrote in 1828, in a clear understanding that we were already fouling our own nest, quote, the river Rhine, it is well known, doth wash the city of Cologne. But tell me, nymphs, what power divine shall henceforth wash the river Rhine? The realization that even in, in Europe, we were beginning to pollute our rivers faster than nature could clean them. This was also a period when cholera and dysentery were rampant in cities like New York and Philadelphia and Cleveland, uh, Chicago, London, Paris, all of the big cities of Europe were experiencing progressively wave after wave of cholera, uh, water-related disease that we didn't know in the mid-1800s was water-related. We didn't understand the connection between human health and water-related diseases, between contaminated water and the byproducts of our growing industrial civilization. This era was also characterized by very rapid advances in chemistry and biology and medicine and engineering, which led to, at the same time, pretty dramatic improvements in our understanding about the connections between human and environmental health and the conditions of our watersheds and water supply. And it was also characterized by remarkable changes in technology as applied to water. We saw the first machines designed to provide water supply 
the first physical and chemical and biological treatment systems for large centralized volumes of water. We saw the first dams of gigantic scale built for water supply and flood control and the first inklings of hydropower, uh, the ability to store water in, dry in wet periods so we could use it in dry periods. And we developed and deployed the technology to build systems to move water, not tens of kilometers in earth filled canals, but hundreds and sometimes thousands of kilometers from where we had water to where we wanted it. From over mountains, uh, across deserts, from glaciers to the cities. We also saw for the first time really large scale irrigation systems that permitted us to bring water to places that previously couldn't grow food in order to provide food for our growing urban populations that couldn't grow enough for their own needs. Cleveland's history actually in some ways epitomizes this second era of water, this transition from the first era to the second era. Cleveland was founded in the early 1800s on the, shore, the shores of Lake Erie, one of the largest bodies of fresh water on the planet. But Cleveland has never had an easy time when it came, ironically enough, when it came to water. Cleveland's first water delivery system was a one-legged veteran of the War of 1812 named Ben Hugh Johnson and his pony and a wagon and two barrels. And Ben Hugh Johnson would sell for two cents a gallon of Lake Erie water to anyone who could pay for it. And that was Cleveland's first water delivery system. Now, needless to say, Cleveland outgrew poor Ben Hugh Johnson and his pony pretty quickly. Um, but by the time of the Civil War, Cleveland had a fairly sophisticated water system of pumps and reservoirs and distribution pipelines that delivered 38,000 gallons of water a day, which at the time was pretty remarkable. By the mid-1960s, untreated municipal wastes, industrial wastes from U.S. cities, from Canadian cities, uh, had turned Lake Erie into a dead zone. And as all of you who are from Cleveland know, and probably most of you who aren't from Cleveland but have been here for a while know, in 1969, Americans turned on their television station, and there were only three at the time, they turned on their televisions to the three stations to see the Cuyahoga River on fire. And that was not the only environmental wake-up call in 1969, but it was a big one. And that led to some remarkable things in the United States. It led to the Clean Water Act. It led to the Safe Drinking Water Act. It led ultimately to the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, which is responsible in large part for protecting water quality around the United States. It also made Cleveland the butt of jokes for a long time, and incidentally led to a great Randy Newman song, uh, which I'll leave for a later conversation. Today, Cleveland's water system I would, I would note, first of all, today Lake Erie is much cleaner than it used to be. It led to a revolution in, in the environmental movement in the United States. Cleveland's water system delivers uh, 90 billion gallons of water a day, high quality, I'm sorry, every year, high quality potable water, and two cents which bought a gallon of water from, from Ben Hugh Johnson now buys nearly 30 gallons of water. And two cents then was worth a lot more than it is today, by the way. So Cleveland has come a long way. And in many ways, as I say, it was the epitome. It's a great example of this transition from what we used to do to what we do in a much, much larger scale today. So it's now the 21st century. All of us grew up in the second era of water. We grew up in this transition to an era of intentional, more and more sophisticated water management. And we all benefited from it. Cholera and dysentery in the United States disappeared within a few years 
of our municipal water system being put in place. Within a few years of our efforts to chlorinate water and filter water and deliver high quality water. We're feeding 7 billion people, almost 7 billion people worldwide because of the Green Revolution, uh, which I would argue is as much a revolution of irrigation technology as it was of sophisticated agricultural practices and crop type. Sophisticated water systems protect us mostly from floods and droughts. They take wastewater away and they deliver high quality water. And we take almost all of it for granted. Uh, I asked some students today how many of them knew where their water, the water that comes out of their tap, came from. And the reality is that the students I were talking to, most of them knew. But most people don't. They don't know where the water that comes out of their tap comes from. And they don't know, even more, where their wastewater goes when they flush their toilet. That's the reality of our water system today. We take it for granted, and we shouldn't, because it's an unbelievably great resource. But it's the 21st century, and things are changing again. Water is once again taking center stage as one of the most critical resource issues facing us, as it did 150 years ago. Why? Because despite the second era of water, despite the enormous advances we made in engineering and biology and chemistry and delivery systems and water management, in spite of our better understanding, in spite of hundreds of billions of dollars spent on water systems, locally and nationally and internationally, we still have a global water crisis. We have not solved all of our water problems. And not only have we not solved our traditional water problems, we haven't begun to face up to the fact that there are some new unresolved water challenges coming down the road or knocking on our door. So what do I mean when I say we have a global water crisis? What is it? What, what does it look like? I much prefer to talk about solutions, and I'm going to talk about solutions, but I'm going to talk briefly about the challenges that face us. First of all, populations continue to grow very rapidly around the world, and we are failing to meet basic human needs for water. And I think this is the biggest piece of a series of interconnected water challenges. There are a billion people worldwide that don't have access to safe drinking water. A billion. And that's inexcusable to me. And there are two and a half billion people that don't have access to adequate sanitation services, which is another fundamental component of the water challenge. And that leads to bad things. It leads to cholera and dysentery and guinea worm and schistosomiasis and all of the water-related diseases that we in the United States don't think about anymore because we got rid of them. But we haven't gotten rid of them globally. And that's a bad thing. There are two million deaths a year about of, from water-related diseases, completely curable or preventable, mostly small children under the age of five. So the failure to meet basic human needs for water is a big problem. Second, we continue to have water quality challenges uh, in different forms, in different ways, in different places at different times, from human and industrial wastes. Industrial wastes are challenging us with new combinations of contaminants. Uh, and there is a classic Kashmiri proverb that says, it is easy to throw something into the river and very difficult to take it out again. And that says it all right there. Uh, the easiest way to prevent water quality problems is not to generate them in the first place. But once we've thrown something into the river, it's hard to take it out again. <coughs> Third, food production requires water. 80% of the water that we use worldwide goes to produce food. And we've done a remarkable thing with food production. But yet, but we still face new challenges. Populations, as I say, continue to grow. We're very rapidly approaching 7 billion people on the planet. Uh, we're going to go to 8 and then 9, and I don't know where we're going to level off. It does look like it's going to level off, which is great news. But that's a lot more people. And we're already at the margins of arable land and water in terms of food production. 
the area of irrigated land is growing a little bit. The, the area under cultivation that's irrigated. But population is growing faster, which means that on a per capita basis, the amount of irrigated land per person worldwide is going down. That means if we want to provide more food, we have to get more efficient. We have to grow more food on each hectare of land. And many regions of the world are experiencing unsustainable pumping of groundwater. Uh, the estimates aren't very good, but some rough estimates are that 30 to 40 percent of the world's food production comes from unsustainable groundwater pumping. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But that can't continue. And eventually, that groundwater is going to get harder and harder to pump and more and more expensive to pump, or it's going to get contaminated with salts. And we're going to have to find other water to meet even current production of food. That's a problem. Fourth, the conflict between human uses of water and ecosystem uses of water is growing. For too long, our use of water, human use of water, has come at the expense of natural ecosystems. And as a result, those ecosystems, which provide critical services for us, are suffering, in some cases being devastated by human uses of water. Many species of fish and other uh, aquatic fauna are threatened or endangered with extinction. Some aquatic ecosystems have been completely destroyed, like the Aral Sea in the former Soviet Union, where all 24 species of fish found only in the Aral Sea are now extinct because of human uses of water, withdrawals of water from the rivers that fed the Aral Sea, the Amudarya and the Sirdarya rivers, for cotton production in the deserts in Central Asia. Many rivers no longer reach their deltas anymore because humans take every drop. Water is a renewable resource, but we can use it all, and we are, and I'll come back to that point shortly. Uh, the Colorado River, shared by the U.S. and Mexico, the delta gets no water in an average year. The Yellow River in China dries up for many weeks of the year because no water reaches, it's all consumed upstream. The Nile, there are many rivers where humans take all of the water. We're also changing the climate, and that will have serious impacts on water. The hydrologic cycle that you all learned about in fifth grade and that you all remember clearly, of course, um, that is evaporation, the formation of clouds, condensation, precipitation, runoff back into the oceans, uh, evaporation again. That, that's the hydrologic cycle. That is the climate cycle. So as we change the climate, we will fundamentally change water availability. Higher temperatures means more evaporation and more demand for water from crops. Uh, we're going to see changes in precipitation patterns. We're already seeing very significant loss of snowpack, uh, loss of glaciers in the Himalayas and the Alps and the Andes is changing runoff patterns for communities downstream. Um, we are changing the climate and it's going to affect water resources and we're not prepared for that. All of the systems that we've built, the dams, the aqueducts, the reservoirs, all of the management things we've put in place to manage our water resources were predicated on the assumption, the fundamental assumption, that tomorrow's climate would look the same as yesterday's climate. The climate was not changing. And if there's anything that the climate science community is telling us is that that assumption is no longer any good. And yet we're not good at integrating climate dynamics and a change in climate into our systems. I will skip my political comments about climate and, and uh, climate change for the moment. But the fifth point is related, and that is that water and politics are very closely connected. Water and politics make a volatile mix. Competition for fresh water is growing among different sectors of our economy, agriculture and industry, between regions, uh, among different users. And along with that competition for water comes the growing risk of conflict, violent conflict. Uh, water has for millennia 
been a source of conflict. Um, one of the things we do at the Pacific Institute is we maintain something called the water conflict chronology. If you like history, um, Google the water conflict chronology and you'll find it right away. It's a list of hundreds of examples of conflicts over water going back 5,000 years to ancient Mesopotamia and as recently as a few weeks ago in different parts of the world. There's a long history of water being used as a source of conflict, a target during conflicts that start for something else, a tool of conflict, uh, tensions over allocations of water. There are a lot of very interesting and um, unfortunately uh, upsetting examples of the connections between water and violence. And we see examples throughout Sumerian myth, legends, history. There's a great example with Julius Caesar and Cleopatra in, 19, in, in uh, 49 BC when water was used as a weapon against Julius Caesar. Uh, there was a war between the city-states of Uma and Lagash in ancient Mesopotamia 5,000 years ago. Um, there are battles between Arizona and, uh, uh, and California. In the 1930s, there was something called the Arizona Navy. You should look it up. It's a, gr it's a great story. Um, I think it was th 1934, 1935. California started construction on something called Parker Dam on the Colorado River to take water from the Colorado for the Imperial Valley and the cities along the coast of California. And Arizona was not happy about that. Arizona shares a border with California on the, color, on the Colorado River. And there was no agreement about how California and Arizona were supposed to share their water. The governor of Arizona called out the militia. They commandeered two little ferry boats on the Colorado River. Um, uh, they mounted a little machine gun in the front of one of these ferry boats, and they went up to this construction site, and they patrolled the river back and forth. It, it's, a, it's a great story. Um, there was no violence uh, at the time, but it was an example of the tensions that arise over water when we don't have institutions in place to allocate water from one user to another. Uh, I believe that many of our problems stem from the fact that in different parts of the world we're reaching what I call peak water. And so I promised a little conversation about peak water. Let, let me describe what I mean by this. A colleague and I wrote a paper earlier uh, last year on peak water. It was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, if you were to Google peak water in my name, I suspect it would, it would come up. Uh, at the top, and we defined three terms, peak renewable water, peak non-renewable water, and peak ecological water. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail on this. You've probably heard about the concept of peak oil, uh, which has been prevalent in the oil and the fossil fuel debate for, for many decades. Uh, the concept of peak oil is that because oil is a non-renewable resource, there's a stock of it, and when you use it up, it's gone. Um, there's the, the idea is that eventually, as we continue to pump oil from that non-renewable stock, it will become harder and harder to get the next barrel of oil, and it will become more and more expensive, and eventually there will be a peak in oil production, and then oil production will begin to decline as the costs increase and as eventually we move to other resources. Uh, the guy who coined that phrase was a guy named M. King Hubbard, a geologist, an oil geologist in the late 1960s. He actually predicted that the U.S. would reach peak oil sometime around 1970, and it did. U.S. oil production peaked in 1970, and it's gone down ever since. And there's a current debate about whether the world is reaching peak oil. Um, it's a function of economics. It's a function of technology. We'll never literally run out of oil. We'll never pump that last barrel out of the ground because it'll be too expensive to do. So there's an economics component to it. There's a political component. But the idea of peak water is a little different. It's, the simi it's similar and it's different in the, in the following way. Peak non-renewable water is very similar to peak oil. There are non-renewable stocks of water around the planet. There are things called fossil aquifers water that was laid down over literally millennia, like oil, uh, and that we are pumping faster than nature recharges it. 
just like oil. So when you have a stock of water that's not renewed quickly enough, and you pump it, water levels drop. It becomes more and more expensive to get, it becomes more difficult to get, and you ultimately will not literally run out, but it will become uneconomic to take more. And around the world, we see peak non-renewable water in northern China, in the Central Valley of California, in the Ogallala Aquifer of the United States, in parts of India, in Libya. There are many stocks of non-renewable water that we are over-pumping. That's peak non-renewable water. And ultimately, again, we're going to have to find other water resources to meet the demands currently being supplied by peak non-renewable water. Okay. Peak renewable water is quite different. Water is mostly a renewable resource. So non-renewable resources are limited by the stock. How much is there? Once it's gone, it's gone. Peak renewable, renewable resources are limited by flow. How much comes to us in a renewable way? So the best example is solar energy. Solar energy is the classic renewable resource. The amount of solar energy we use has no effect whatsoever on how much the sun puts out tomorrow. It's renewable. The amount that we can use is limited by our ability to capture the flow. Once you've captured all of the solar energy striking the Earth, that's it. You can't capture anymore. I get, I, you know, we could put satellites and, and expand, in a sense, the area we could capture, but it's flow limited. And of course, we're never going to capture all of the solar energy striking the Earth. Water is the same way. Water is a renewable resource. The amount of water in a river is limited by the flow. And once you use it all, you can't use any more. And so it comes back to the Colorado River as an example. Once we use the entire flow of the Colorado River, we've reached a peak renewable limit. And on the Colorado, we're there. We use it all. Now, there are wet years, there are dry years. The amount that comes every year varies, but we're at the limits. So the third concept, peak ecological water, is also a little different. Water provides us with benefits. We're very good at measuring the economic benefits. Put another gallon of water on a piece of irrigated land and you can grow a little more food. And you can sell that in a market and it's quantifiable. Use another gallon of water to make a semiconductor chip. You can measure the economic benefits of water. So the more water we use, the more economic benefit we get. The more water we use, however, the more ecological harm we cause. And we're good at measuring the economic benefit. We're not so good at measuring the eco ecologic harm caused by our water use. But it's real. And there's a whole great new intellectual field out there called ecological economics. And the point of ecological economics is to try and put values on these ecological benefits we get. But it's, it's a new field, and it's struggling to quantify some of those benefits. But the idea of peak ecological water is that we reach a point where the ecological harm outweighs the economic benefit. It's, it's that simple. We reach a point where the next gallon of water we use causes more ecological damage than it provides economic benefit. That's the theory. That's the concept behind peak ecological water. We're not good at finding that point because we can't quantify the ecological harm very well, but it's real. And I would argue, and we argue in our paper, that for a lot of places, we're already past the point of peak ecological water. And the Aral Sea is a good example. All 24 species of fish are extinct. Now, how do you value species extinction? I don't know. But I would argue, and it's my opinion, that the value of species extinction is higher than the value of the cotton that was produced with the water that caused those extinctions. So I would be inclined to argue that we are long past the point of peak ecological water in the Aral Sea. That's the idea of peak water. And it has enormous implications for how we manage renewable resources, non-renewable resources, and ecological resources. And we're just beginning to figure out how to do that 
around the world. Now, our first reaction to these water problems is that we just need to pay more attention. We need to put more effort or more, or more money or design better institutions to deal with them. And I think that's partly true. We need to put more money and pay more attention and put more institutional effort into dealing with our water problems. But I'd like to argue something else, that doing more of the same thing that we did in the 20th century isn't enough, that we're not gonna solve 21st century water problems only using 20th century tools. I think the tools we applied brought great benefits. The infrastructure we built, the institutions we created. Don't misunderstand me. I think we, we, we have brought enormous benefits with the approaches we used in the 20th century. But I think there is room for new answers and new ideas. And so for the remainder of my talk, let me offer uh, an alternative future, if you will. A positive vision for water for what I call the third era in water, which I think we're, is beginning now. I think we're in a transition from the second era to the third era of water. And I think there's a lot of good news out there around water. We live in a period of time when there are enormous opportunities. There are different ideas and innovative technologies and uh, approaches being explored and tried. There's more attention being given to water the year of water, I mean, who would have thought that a couple of years ago? Uh, and there are a lot of bright, talented, and very dedicated people working on this issue. Now, uh, before I describe this positive vision for the future, I, I, I'm gonna give you a little disclaimer, and this is my Dante's Inferno interlude, if you will. I'm not sure how many of you have read Dante's Inferno in the last week or two, and so for those of you who haven't, let me remind you how it goes. Um, Dante offers a vision, Dante's Inferno offers a vision of hell. And there are nine circles. And the book is an allegory, and, and it's a voyage, if you will, from the uppermost circles of hell down to the bottom most horrible circles where the devil resides. And sinners are placed in different levels depending on the severity of their sins. It's, it's actually a great read. Um, it's actually a political story. There are all sorts of people who were living at the time Dante wrote this, who he places, or recently dead, who he places in different circles of hell by name. Um, writers, popes, uh, industry, uh, politicians. I mean, it's really sort of interesting if you read it in the context of history. And I won't, I won't bore you with the details, but deep down, I think in the eighth circle of hell, which is pretty far down because there are only nine, oh, and each sinner gets a, a punishment fitted to their sin, and they're pretty gruesome. Um, okay, so deep down in circle eight, in, in level eight in, in one of the circles, are fortune tellers and prognosticators and presumably if he were writing it today, climate scientists and modelers and economic forecasters and, um, and so on, and, and people who present positive visions around water. And for those sinners, for those fortune tellers, their punishment is to go through eternity with their heads on backwards so they can't see where they're going, they can only see where they've been, which historians love although there are plenty of historians down there too. Okay, so that's, with the understanding that my vision is no more accurate than anybody else's, my crystal ball is no clearer than yours, let me offer a positive vision of the future. I can imagine a world where the human right to water is acknowledged and met as a top priority, and basic human needs for water are met for everyone, for water supply and sanitation, where water is properly priced and allocated, where ecosystems have an equal say in allocations of water and have water rights as do humans, where water quality is universally monitored and measured and protected, where more food is grown with less 
water, where aquatic ecosystems are restored, where groundwater pumping is brought within sustainable limits, where conflicts over water are addressed diplomatically and socially, not militarily. It's the vision that's sort of the opposite of where we are today. It's where all of our water problems are solved. And the good news is, I think we can reach that vision. And so let me describe the soft path for water, which is a, another concept that we work on at the Institute that helps define how to get from where we are today to this third era, this, this positive, sustainable vision for water. First, we have to refocus our efforts to meet basic human needs for water as a top priority. And that means that, that governments, international aid organizations, uh, corporations, NGOs, private groups, all have to work to meet basic human needs as a top priority, as a fundamental human right. And I, I would note, um, I've been working on the issue of a human right to water for a long time. I wrote a paper in 1999 on this. Um, last fall in September, the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva passed a binding resolution declaring a human right to water. It, it was, it's an unbelievable advance. It's a, it's a great thing. I don't believe it's going to solve all water problems, but it's a huge step forward in acknowledging this critical basic unmet need. I would also argue that the economic costs of meeting, a, meeting basic water needs for everyone is tiny. It's tens of billions of dollars a year. It, it's, and it doesn't require new technology. It requires a, an investment of money, a reasonable investment of money, and it requires a reasonable investment of commitment on the part of governments and non-governmental organizations. It requires will. And I think it's possible to meet basic human needs for everyone. Uh, I think we can do it. I would argue the US could play an enormous role in this with technology, with education, with money, with political commitment, but we're not playing the role that I think the US could play at, in the international arena. Second, we have to address the wrongs done to the environment in the name of water development. It's possible to move back from peak ecological water to the point where the economic benefits and the social benefits of water don't outweigh the ecological costs of water. But that requires understanding better the ecological costs of the things we do. It requires better quantifying ecological benefit. If we're going to use cost-benefit analysis as a tool, let's understand truly all of the costs and all of the benefits, which is not something we're good at. And the good news is we see efforts to restore river flows. We see efforts to protect endangered species. The new constitution of South Africa, rewritten after the fall of apartheid, guarantees water for basic human needs and basic ecological goods and services. A remarkable thing. We don't, we don't have that in the United States. But it's possible to do, and there are success stories from around the world of restoration of ecosystems. We're going to have to deal with global climate change, one way or the other. And in fact, both ways. We're going to have to work to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but we're also committed to irreversible climate change already. So we have to slow the severity and the rate of climate change, and we're going to have to deal with unavoidable consequences. I describe it as, as uh, working to avoid the consequences of climate change that we're not going to be able to manage, and figuring out how to manage the consequences of climate change that we're not going to be able to avoid. We have to do both. And for water, that means changing the assumptions about the way we manage our water systems and the way we design our water systems. Third, we have to rethink both supply and demand. 20th century or, or maybe second era water philosophy was let's deal with supply. Demand was assumed to be unchanging. We would ju just meet whatever demand materialized. And we would do that by increasing supply. We'd build another dam, we'd build another aqueduct, we'd tap another groundwater well. And uh, that worked for a while, but as I've described, not really all that well in the long run. And we sort of ignored demand. 
I think we have to rethink demand. In particular, there is inefficient use of water in every sector of our society. I would argue that there's nothing we do with water today that we couldn't do with less water. Nothing. Maybe not nothing, but almost nothing. We can grow more food with less water. We can wash our clothes with less water. We can make semiconductors with less water. Uh, that's the concept of efficiency. I don't mean shorter showers. I don't mean brown lawns. That's conservation. And we do those things in an emergency. I mean efficiency. And maybe we have to do conservation and change, change some of the things we do also. But the first step ought to be improving efficiency. And the good news is there's enormous potential to improve water use efficiency and reduce demand without reducing benefits. And we've done a lot of work on this in the agricultural sector and the urban sector at the, at the Pacific Institute. And that helps us move back from peak renewable water and peak non-renewable water and peak ecological water. It helps on all the fronts. And the good news, again, is that this is already happening. So here's a fact that most of you probably don't know, and it's the most stunning fact I can probably leave you with. But the United States uses less water today for everything than we used 30 years ago. Population's growing, our economy's growing exponentially. The assumption has always been in the second era of water that our demand for water would grow exponentially. It's no longer true. We use less water today in the United States, I'll say it again, in the, in the United States for everything than we used 30 years ago. We've broken the link. In a sense, we're moving away from the assumption that demand always has to increase. And we're doing it with efficiency, changes in the structure of the economy. A, a whole reason, a whole set of reasons are involved in that, which I won't get into. But it's a remarkable fact. And per capita, that means we're using a lot less water per person than we used to 30 years ago. Let me give you a couple of examples. It used to take 200 tons of water to make a ton of steel in the US. It now takes in the best steel plants worldwide, three or four tons of water to make a ton of steel. 200 down to three or four tons of water to make a ton of steel. That's a 95 plus percent improvement in efficiency. It used to take 30 gallons of water to make a square inch of semiconductors. The best semiconductor plants today use five or six gallons of water. Those are improvements in efficiency. And there are many, many, many more examples. I would argue we need to still think about supply. There are places around the world where we need new dams, we need new infrastructure, we need new hard path tools, but we also could expand what we mean by supply. Treated wastewater, rainwater harvesting, um, uh, conjunctive use where we're managing surface water and groundwater differently, desalination and advanced water treatment. There are lots of new ideas for supply that don't require tapping another renewable but tapped out river or non-renewable groundwater aquifer. Fourth, we have to protect water quality. Uh, a key priority is protecting the quality of our tap water. As many of you know, um, I recently wrote a book on bottled water called Bottled and Sold, the story behind our obsession with bottled water. And I'm not gonna talk about bottled water today. Uh, that's a completely separate talk. But I, I would note that one of the reasons we drink more bottled water than we used to is fear of tap water. Valid or not, we're increasingly worried about or told to fear our tap water. We have a wonderful tap water system in this country, an unbelievably great system. I would be the first to argue it ought to be better than it is. There are contaminants that we don't regulate that may or may not be a problem for health, but that we ought to know if they're a problem for health. There are new technologies for improving the quality of tap water. Um, we need to upgrade and maintain our tap water system at a far lower cost than bottled water, I would note. So that's a little digression, but it's connected to this question about water quality. Let's also recognize that different uses of water require waters of different quality. Why do we use potable water to flush our toilets? 
We use potable water to flush our toilets because that's the system we built. But we didn't have to build that system, and there are alternatives. There are better ways of matching the quality of water we have with the quality of water we need. Fifth, I think we need to be smarter about economics. We don't price water properly. Uh, we don't develop water markets where it's potential to do so. I think very strongly water is a human right, but water is also an economic good. Let's figure out how to use economics to get the policies in place that we want. Finally, we have to improve our water institutions. Charles Darwin said, quote, if the misery of our poor be caused not by the laws of nature but by our institutions, great is our sin. And the reality is the misery of our poor is caused by our institutions often. It's not caused by the laws of nature. And so we have to manage water institutionally for the 21st century, not for the 20th century. And that means our water institutions have to change, our universities have to change more than teaching engineering or hydrology. You have to teach water economics and water institutions and water equity, the integrated aspects of water. It means utilities are going to have to rethink water planning. It means cities are going to have to rethink where they, where they build subdivisions and rethink the assumption that the water is always going to be there. It means new collaborations between farmers and academics or between farmers and farmers. New institutions are also going to be key. So what will the future really bring? Can we reach this rosy future, or are we condemned to a perpetual water crisis? A future we can see clearly, but, but we don't want, a bad future. Uh, as that famous philosopher Casey Stengel said, quote, making predictions is very difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> and I don't know where we're going to end up. I don't know whether we're going to reach this rosy, optimistic water future or whether we're going to see the future that we can see more clearly but we know we don't want. That depends on what we do. That depends on the path we choose to take and the choices we make as individuals, as scientists, as managers, as engineers, as communities, as, as academics, as, as uh, whatever we are. As we reach the limits of our water supply, our shift has to focus to a new way of thinking about water. Water is precious, it's scarce, it's a vital resource, and our use of it has to be thoughtful and sustainable and carefully planned. Welcome to the future. Thank you. You, you talked about how the water usage in the United States is going down, even in what I assume is a climate where there's not a great price driver to this. So why shouldn't we just project forward and say, well, everything's going to be hunky-dory anyway, because we've improved so much <coughs> without thinking about it effectively. What's, what, what has driven that improvement? Cheaper to reduce their volume of water use and their volume of wastewater rather than pay to treat wastewater. So the Clean Water Act in 1974, or whatever it was, uh, put a price, in a sense, on wastewater because it said, thou shalt not dump crap into our rivers and lakes anymore. It was a regulation, um, and it required industry to change the way they dealt with wastewater, and it turned out one of the ways to produce less wastewater was become more efficient. So that, that, that was... That's not necessarily an economic price, although it actually had an economic component. It was a regulatory price. So there are all sorts of factors that have been driving that change and that I think could drive it much further if we paid even more, even more attention. 1974, or whatever it was, uh, put a price, in a sense, on wastewater because it said, thou shalt not dump crap into our rivers and lakes anymore. It was a regulation, um, and it required industry to change the way they dealt with wastewater, and it turned out one of the ways to produce less wastewater was become more efficient. So that, that, that was, that's not necessarily an economic price, although it actually had an economic component. It was a regulatory price. So there are all sorts of factors that have been driving that change, and that I think could drive it much further if we paid even more, even more attention. Question about the Great Lakes. Um, many would argue that the Great Lakes are uh, what you would define as a non-renewable 
source of water because of how slowly they recharge. It's really fossil water left by the last uh, glaciation. Um, to protect the water from other thirsty parts of the country that might want to withdraw water, the Great Lakes governors uh, created the Great Lakes Compact uh, to create kind of a legal bulwark against uh, diversions. Do you think that's going to be enough, or should we still be worrying about the, the Great Lakes? OK, well, absolutely we should be worrying about the Great Lakes. I don't worry about big diversions from the Great Lakes. Um, the idea that we would ever find the money, not to mention the political will to, or agreement, <laughs> to move water out of the Great Lakes Basin into the Southwest. I mean, engineers are great at designing things. There are plenty of designs on the books to do that. I, I just think that it's, it's literally a pipe dream. Um, there was some talk about filling water filling tankers with Great Lakes water and exporting it, that's never going to happen either because diesel fuel for tankers is really expensive and by the time you get it out to the Atlantic, it's too expensive and desalination is cheaper. But there's plenty to worry about the Great Lakes in terms of protecting water quality, um, dealing with the inevitable consequences of climate change. The Great Lakes are a funny resource because it's a huge, huge body of fresh water, as you know. but. It's in equilibrium with the environment. The level of the Great Lakes is determined by two things, how much water goes in and how much water comes out. It's like a bathtub. And if you start taking more out, either intentionally or unintentionally through evaporation, and you don't put any more in, the level starts to drop. Now, we're never going to use up the Great Lakes. The, huge, the amount of water is huge. But as those of you who live on the shores of the Great Lakes know, a little bit of an increase in Great, Great Lakes level or a little bit of a decrease in Great Lakes level causes serious problems of one kind or another. So there, there are plenty of challenges for the Great Lakes in terms of management, in terms of dealing with natural variability, in terms of dealing with non-natural climatic change. Um, so I think there's plenty to worry about. I, I think the Great Lakes Agreement is a wonderful thing. It's a great example of smart management of the Great Lakes. You get the eight states and the two provinces, two countries, lots of political borders that had to be crossed to get that agreement. It's a good example of smart management, but that alone doesn't mean it's invulnerable to potential bad things. You spoke in your vision for the future about doing more with less in terms of agriculture. And I'm assuming that covers both plant and animal agricultures. So I was thinking about that in the idea of efficiency. And it strikes me that one of the largest inefficiencies in the way we're using water in agriculture is how we use all this water to grow a bunch of corn and soybeans and then feed that to a bunch of uh, livestock animals for dairy and meat. And then we give them even more water to keep them alive until they're ready for slaughter and then we eat them instead of just eating a plant-based diet and the plant proteins uh, directly from things like corn and soybeans. So do you think that uh, a shift in diet has a role in, in increasing that uh, type of efficiency? Do you think that would have an impact that would be measurable or insignificant? And is shifting our diet a potential way that we can help manage our water better? Yes, absolutely. Um, we actually did a report on agricultural efficiency called more with less. Um, and we focused on irrigation efficiency, how to grow more food with less water, how to better manage agricultural water. Um, but we've also written about this question of diet. Uh, the question of diet is fundamental to a whole series of new food challenges that the world is right on the cusp of dealing with. Um, as the developing world gets richer, and as their diets change, their diets move more from a plant-based to a meat-based diet as well. More calories are provided by meat than they used to. Um, they're trying to do what we did a century ago. And meat calories are much more water intensive, as you clearly point out, than vegetable calories. And so there is a serious water consequence of meat diets. 
Uh, it's going to affect demand for grain. It's going to affect demand for water. It's going to affect agricultural production. It's going to affect markets. It's going to affect the price of food. All of those things are true. Y you said it very well in your, in your question. And uh, moving away from a meat-based diet, even slightly, has enormous positive impact on the demand for water, the demand for grain, the price of food, all of those things. I'm not a vegetarian. I love meat, I'm sorry to say. Um, but I eat a lot less of it than I used to. Uh, I'm trying to eat down the food chain. And frankly, my diet's improved, <laughs> I think, enormously. It's probably good from a health perspective as well. So it, it, is, it is an important factor. You're looking good. <laughs> um, is, is, that, is that true uh, for, for, uh, for grass-fed instead of grain-fed? You mentioned grain. I assume that's a big part of the water cycle for those. You know, uh, Corn-fed beef, for instance, uh, that's a lot of water. For, it takes a huge amount of water. Uh, grass-fed beef presumably is a lot less water. Than... Well, OK. So here's an... Yeah, yeah no, okay. no, that's an important distinction. Um, we tend to focus on the water that we measure. We're good at measuring how much water we take out of rivers, out of groundwater, and we use for irrigation. But the reality is humans use a lot more water in the form of rain. We just don't measure that really well. We sort of, OK, that's different. It's, it's in, the, in the field, we call it blue water and green water. Um, but we use a lot of water as rain that if we didn't use on, uh, if we didn't use on agriculture, would flow in our rivers. So you can't ignore it. Uh, it, but it does, anyway, it's an important, it's an important point, but. Uh, I think, you know, over the last few years especially, and uh, uh, especially in China, India, Mexico, for different reasons, biofuels subsidy being one in Mexico. And uh, water is uh, related to that. I mean, water is uh, difficult to transport. And then we have, on the other hand, the Dublin principle, which water is an economic good. Now, balancing between that and uh, the way food prices are going, and poverty. What do you see the balance as, as you go further in your vision? OK, so I believe water is a human right and an economic good, both. Um, I could argue that water ought to be free, but maybe water service, you'd be paying for water services. Uh, the Quran says very clearly water ought to be free, but Islamic scholars have also been pretty clear that um, it's okay to pay for water services. So I don't, see a distinct, I don't see a necessary conflict there, but we're not very good at balancing those things. And it, it's an equity question, which is really what, what you're asking. Um, I think basic human needs ought to be met for water and food uh, as a top priority. And for reasons of poverty, if you can't afford uh, water, it ought to be provided free. The rest of us can afford to subsidize it. But I ought to pay the full cost of my water and wastewater in my developed country urban existence. And I do, pretty much. Not, not quite the full cost, but pretty close. Um, and so that's a, that's a balancing act. And we're not good at balancing those things yet. But moving in that direction, I think, would go a long way to, towards solving poverty, issues of poverty. You know, a related part of that is, um, a, a good example, which maybe you were suggesting, but you didn't, you didn't say explicitly, of our inability to, to think about some of these things in an interdisciplinary way, is this question of ethanol. Um, I mentioned this earlier. I forget who I was talking with. But it's absolutely a great idea for the United States to import less fossil fuels, fewer fossil fuels, less petroleum. There's a national security cost. There's an economic cost. There's an environmental cost. If we can produce more liquid fuels domestically, that's, that's potentially a great thing. And so from our very narrow perspective, the Congress passed big subsidies for ethanol, corn-based ethanol. Without thinking about food or food prices, without thinking about water, just thinking about this one piece of the puzzle. Um, and in fact, subsidies for ethanol means producers grow a lot more corn. The corn doesn't go to, it doesn't even go to cows. It doesn't go, it doesn't go to anything. It doesn't go to world markets. The price of corn goes up. The price of food in Mexico goes up. Uh, water resources are used non-sustainably to grow. You, you, know, you get the idea. It's a good example of our 
inability to think across disciplines and the consequences of, of not doing that. Um, three years ago, I was in Las Vegas, which is a city <laughs> profligate in everything, including water. And when I happened to be there in 2008, I saw that they were putting in all, this is a desert, right? The Nevada desert. So they're putting in all these um, streets and suburban homes and with their lawns and everything. And they have their casinos with the water fountains going up into the air. And when you're coming in to, for a landing or else if you drive around, you visit Lake Mead and you can see how Lake Mead has, has dropped down so low you can see the bathtub ring around the edge and it's visible from the airplane as you're coming in. And during the time I was there, there were all kinds of discussions in the paper about doing things like running a pipeline to, to Lake Erie running a pipeline over the Sierras into uh, the Pacific Ocean and having a desalination plant. Even as they were building these new suburbs with these lawns that presumably needed to be watered, they're talking about piping water in from elsewhere. Is this a pipe dream or, I mean, Las Vegas is talking about it. Okay, a great example of uh, our failure to think about urban planning in the context of resource availability. Las Vegas is the epitome of that. And we've actually done quite a bit of work at my institute in Las Vegas, looking at their potential for water use efficiency improvements. Um, now, uh, Lake Mead is low not because of Las Vegas. L Las Vegas takes its water from Lake Mead, but only a very fixed allocation. Most of the demand on the Colorado River is, is elsewhere, and that's drawing down Lake Mead. But it certainly is a, a graphic representation of the challenges that the entire region faces. And the responses that you describe uh, are typical. It's the classic, whatever I build, I'll find the water for it, which I described in my talk. Now, they'll never build a pipeline to Lake Erie. They'll never build a pipeline to the Pacific Ocean. Um, they are talking about building a pipeline to northern Nevada and tapping groundwater. Um, uh, so the, the, your, your point is, is exactly right. They have not fully grasped the limits, resource limits that face us. Um, now, in the last two years, Las Vegas has been especially hard hit by the, re by the recession, by the decline in building. It was a very rapidly growing city. So the pressure on their water has diminished a little bit, but not completely. And they've not completely come to grips with the realities that face them. It's a, it's a good example. I, uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, coming and giving this, this talk. Um, also, uh, how would you argue against those who say that the climate change that we're experiencing today is not simply part of a natural fluctuation in Earth climate change? Um, it, de it would depend on who I was talking to. If I was talking to someone who was really interested in the answer to that question, I would talk to them about the science that clearly shows that humans are influencing the climate, uh, that shows the historical record of climate, that, I, I mean, the science is clear. The, client, the science is unambiguous. Every scientific society in the world, every one in the fields of climate, meteorology, geophysics, geology, um, chemistry, acknowledges that, the human, that humans are fundamentally changing the climate. Um, that's the science. Uh, if I was arguing with someone that didn't really want to argue the science, but was worried about the policy responses that we might put in place to deal with changing climate, that's a different question, and, and in, my, in my view, a much more interesting one and a more challenging one, and one we ought to be having. I think the argument is not actually about the science. I think the argument is about one of two things. It's the fossil fuel industry trying to protect itself. Or it's people who don't believe that um, the government should play a big role in managing environmental challenges and don't want to see regu more regulation or taxes or a cap and trade system and are worried that if they acknowledge the science, that's what it's going to lead to. Th that's, I do a lot of work on climate. My background is hydroclimatology. Um, I, I argue with climate deniers all the time. 
Um, there are lots of uncertainties about climate change, um, but in my opinion, and in the opinion of the scientific community around the world, it's not whether the climate's going to change, it's not whether humans are changing it, it's not whether it's already changing, it's about more subtle nuances. That's what I would say. I've come across, especially from the perspective of economics, um, I've come across several different plans as to um, what uh, we can do to alter, <clears throat> um, alter the economics so that it becomes more profitable to be uh, more conservative. And I've seen things from a water tax, basically an equivalent uh, to a carbon tax. I've seen things to an environmental label um, that discusses the carbon and the water input into a product. Um, but you also just discussed how um, a lot of the descent to climate change, for example, is brought about by the fossil fuel industry trying to protect itself. The fossil fuel industry b being arguably, if not the, in the top three most powerful industries on the planet. Uh, I feel like, you know, you stated before that, that agriculture uses 80% of the water on the planet. And I would also state that agriculture is, is, again, one of the top three most powerful corporations on the planet. So, who, you know, who have a, a very powerful um, hold on governments worldwide, let alone in the United States. And, you know, you, you referenced how fossil, I mean, how um, the idea of getting rid of fossil fuels is a good idea, but the idea of subsidizing corn, which is already massively subsidized, um, is basically just putting more money and, and, and altering the economics in a negative way and increasing um, the damages to the water. So my question is this. What can consumers do to alter the state of affairs today? Because I, I really don't see that this change will come about from a top-down um, way. Um, that's a very tough question. Without a doubt, economics is critical, and the structure of our economic systems uh, complicates many of the solutions that, that perhaps ought to be implemented. Um, I also believe that economics can be a powerful tool if we can figure out how to harness it. Um, there is increasing effort to put a price on water, uh, a fair price to deal with equitable access to water, but at the same time make sure that people understand from an economic perspective the consequences of using water. The higher the price of water, like the higher the price of anything, the less we're going to use. The higher the price of water, the more likely we are to put in place technologies to use water more efficiently. And we see this already happening. The good news is I think it's already happening. There are enormous difficulties in doing what you're suggesting that have to do with fundamental economics. And I think that's one of the, it's one of the challenges we face. It's one of the exciting academic areas and policy areas in figuring out how to harness the powers of economics to, to deal with some of these resource and sustainability questions. I do think there's an enormous role for individual action. So um, we make decisions every day as consumers those choices ultimately affect the markets, slowly, incrementally, but potentially powerfully. So um, I don't buy bottled water. Not never, I've been known to buy bottled water, but if I can avoid it, I don't buy bottled water. Okay, so that's an industry that doesn't get my dollars, um, and that's a consumer choice. As we educate people more about the quality of tap water, as we improve our tap water system to make sure that it's, that it's as good as it ought to be, that'll reduce the incentive to buy bottled water. It's a good example. Um, people who go and buy forest certified wood under the international new standards for sustainable forestry are making a statement. And that's, that affects the markets, and there's efforts to develop certification standards for water as well. Um, there are companies that are trying to be responsible in the water space or in the resource space. They deserve our business, and the companies that aren't don't deserve our business. Th those are individual decisions as well, and I think 
all of those things can, can play a role uh, in, in moving toward this more sustainable vision. Uh, Two-part question, uh, quickly. Uh, in your talk, you talked about the concept of peak oil, and uh, there are those, perhaps, with their heads screwed on backwards that are uh, projecting that we're going to ha that we flatlined in production at about 85 million barrels a day since uh, 2005, and some see an indefinite undulating plateau. Others see soon we're going to be uh, production is going to be declining 5 percent a year. So it'll be the collapse of economic growth, collapse uh, perhaps uh, of economies. And how, in a post-peak oil world, can you provide water? Or is post-peak oil mean post-peak water? And as oil goes down, oil uh, water delivery will go down with it. The second part of it, in 2003 here, we had a big power failure. In fact, First Energy is very proud we caused it all, shut down the whole no Northeast blackout because we weren't uh, cutting our tree limbs. And so we were with, without power essentially for a couple of days, and we weren't, the water production at our three water treatment plants slowed down or virtually non-existent. And now supposedly we have lots of uh, diesel fuel on hand and pumps, and we're ready, but I don't know if we're ready for a week or two uh, uh, without electric power. So the issue is this, shouldn't water, which is a greatly, greatly centralized, not too many of us here have, uh, uh, water wells are dependent upon these three big plants. Shouldn't water like energy be distributed, uh, decentralized, localized, both uh, production and distribution, rather than having these highly centralized systems because you've got the law of the minimum, right? If you're not getting oil, uh, if you're not getting electricity, how are we going to get, say, potable drinking water? Um, there are very strong connections between energy and water. It takes energy to clean, treat, move water around. It takes water to produce energy. And we actually do a lot of work on this at the Institute. Um, I don't believe that peak oil, uh, if we reach a peak in oil, means the collapse of civilization. Um, presumably, if society continues to function, it will mean more and more expensive oil. And ultimately, more and more expensive oil means we move to alternative sources of energy. Eventually, solar becomes cheaper than oil or coal. Eventually, wind becomes cheaper. And then we transition. It's called a backstop technology. Um, if our energy system collapses, without a doubt, our water system will also collapse. But that may not be the, that, that may not be the biggest problem we face. Um, so I think what we want to figure out how to do is transition our energy system to a more sustainable, renewable system. I, th I like the idea of distributed water. I don't think that's necessary entirely. We have big cities. We have infrastructure that we've invested in. Um, there's no reason why we can't continue to provide centralized water supply and treatment under a whole range of different energy scenarios. Um, but I also like the idea of working to decentralize some water systems. Uh, and that, well, I've written a little bit about this, but not very much. It's, a, it's an area where I think a lot more thinking needs to be done. Uh, thanks again for coming out. Um, I know you briefly discussed <coughs> climate change and that's role in the upcoming uh, shifts in water, but how do you see some of the secondary effects of climate change, such as the increasing ocean acidity influencing <coughs> the uh, changes in our water system, and in particular, that new, oh, that new water chemistry that's po <coughs> posing some new issues for our system. So climate change is a big deal. Um, climate's a complicated thing. It affects, it affects uh, water and food production and sea level rise in our coastal communities and storm frequency and intensity and ocean acidity. Um, a lot of the impacts of climate change, but not all of them, are tied to our water system. So higher temperatures, as I said, is going to mean more demand for water from certain kinds of crops. Uh, it's going to mean more evaporation from the surface of our reservoirs. Rising sea level is going to affect the health of coastal wetlands that get fresh water and salt water in, in mixed combinations. Um, I haven't thought much about ocean acidity, acidity and the connection with water, but there are lots of connections with climate and water that we ought to get better at thinking about. Um, I said earlier there, 
You know, I believe very strongly that climate's changing and it's changing because of human activities. There are plenty of uncertainties, largely around the consequences and the costs. And some of the impacts are, are very badly understood uh, and, and need a lot more analysis and, and assessment, uh, and not just in the water area. Do you think the water scarcity problem in this country could ever get to the point where there's a population shift back to the Great Lakes states and away from the south and uh, that it could uh, be a boon for the economies of the Great Lakes states where businesses and people move back to the Great Lakes states and uh, they become water rich, kind of like the way Texas is oil rich? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know why we live in, like to live in really hot, dry places, although those of you who've just been through the last winter may know much more clearly than me. Um, we moved population to the southwest because, not be, because we weren't paying attention to water. We were paying attention to other things. I do believe it's possible that, that as we start to pay more attention to water, we'll see population shifts again. Um, maybe to the Great Lakes, maybe to other, to other places. I think climate change is gonna drive some of those changes as well. The hot, dry places are gonna get hotter, a lot hotter, um, and I think that's gonna be a challenge. I don't know whether the Great Lakes will benefit from that or have to manage new population dynamics that they don't like, but I think it's possible that that, that population shift will start to occur. Um, already, there are parts of the world where you can't build Northern China, for example, is putting limits on new water intensive industry. Northern China is relatively water short. The water in China is in the south. And you can't build a new water intensive industry around Beijing because they don't have the water. So they're building it in water rich areas. Maybe some of the water rich areas of the United States will seem more attractive to water intensive industries once again. Uh, I think that's a possibility.